Good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's Montreat Wednesday presentation. Tonight is the first of a two-part series called Practicing and Growing Resilience During the Pandemic. Tonight, Ann Seaman and Mason Blake will be in conversation with two professional-level representatives from Resources for Resilience, Victor Jones from Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Reverend Beth Turner of St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Burnsville, North Carolina. We're delighted to have both of them with us tonight. Beth is a certified presence-based coach. That's an approach to human development that includes the fields of somatics and neuroscience and developmental psychology. Victor is a husband and father of two, a dually licensed mental health provider, and a circle of security parenting facilitator. Tonight's presentation, The Wisdom of Your Body's Safety and Threat Management System, will touch on the neuroscience of resilience, how people are hardwired for connection, and staying connected when it's tough. Then two weeks from tonight on February 10th, the second part of our program will offer, will offer simple tools that you can put into practice starting now. We are very grateful to Anne Dupree Rogers and everybody over at Resources for Resilience for helping to make these programs possible. Mason Blake and the entire Christian Education Committee of Montreat Presbyterian Church are the ones who put together our programs uh, for the whole year and we're delighted with the programming that they're providing. And Mason is a co-host tonight along with Anne Seaman. Anne is also the technical director and editor of these programs. We are grateful to all of them and we're grateful to you. Thank you for being here tonight for Tonight's Montre Wednesday presentation, Practicing and Growing Resilience During the Pandemic. Good evening, everybody, and we want to um, welcome you to this conversation. Um, about how to listen to our body's safety and threat management system, especially during this time of um, physical separation and lots of the things that are um, making it harder because of this pandemic that we're all living through together. And uh, my name's Beth Turner. I'm a pastor in Burnsville, North Carolina at a small Episcopal church. And I'm also a trainer for Resources for Resilience. Uh, which is based in Asheville. And I know that you all are very fond of Anne Dupree Rogers, who's the executive director of Resources for Resilience, a dear friend of mine. We're both preacher's kids and have lots of other things in common. And it's uh, really special for my colleague, Victor, and I, who's going to introduce himself in just a moment to get to share some of um, this information with your community and uh, especially talking about why this is so important right now. All right. Uh, well, welcome. Well, thank you for um, allowing us to be here with you at this time. Very excited to bring this information forward to uh, to communities that care for each other and that we care about a great deal. My name is Victor Jones. I'm in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. I'm also a resilience educator and a licensed clinical social worker. And uh, this body of work is very important for my self-care and it's really helped me a great deal in how I move through life at this time. So it's an ongoing project that I love greatly and super excited about sharing this with you. you no, know, I I've neglected to say that, Victor, myself, that this stuff is really important to each of us personally. I think it's really changed how all of us do our work um, especially how we connect with others and how we show each other a lot of grace, which is something that we're going to talk about tonight, as we understand that it really makes sense how our bodies and brains uh, respond to stressful experiences. So, yeah, this means a lot to me personally as well. And I want to thank um, Ann and Mason, who have invited us to do this, and we've asked them to be like part of the the conversation because it makes it feel more like a community, which is what your church is. And to just come uh, be a part of this tonight, just as themselves, not uh, scripted or, uh, you know, worrying about any of that, but just as um, humans together caring for one another and um, sharing some information that can be a real game changer. 
So uh, Ann or Mason, you want to say anything? Well, I just or like not. to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would just like to welcome everybody viewing in. Uh, we're so grateful to Beth and Victor for being here with us and sharing this valuable information with us. It's a very important all the time, but particularly at this time as we struggle through a, a winter of, of COVID, uh, hopefully our, the last protracted period of being isolated from each other. But isolation is taking its toll on all of us. We all know that. And these, this program is designed to help us help ourselves through that. And Absolutely. Well, I think we would like to just talk a little bit about um, resources for resilience and what the purpose of that organization is. I know you all have had some exposure to this through Anne Dupree, but maybe some new folks are coming on board and it wouldn't hurt to just review a little bit about what it is uh, that we do and uh, why we're doing it. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen here just to put a few words up. So there you go. This is a um, 501c3 based in Asheville. And I want to give a shout out to your congregation for caring about this cause and for your generous support. I understand you um, have been quite gracious to this organization that helps children and adults and incarcerated persons and school teachers and um, churches and all kinds of agencies. So I want to just say thank you for that. Um, this is a 501c3, as I said, based in Asheville, and our mantra is learn, practice, and thrive. So we teach some information in this first session. Um, there'll be two parts to this. We'll be a little bit more on the didactic side, um, and then the second one will be a lot more about the tools. This is a tool-based um, curriculum which is great news because we know we can practice things and get good at them, and that helps us to kind of um, own this in our bodies and um, kind of becomes default and second nature to learn how to um, settle ourselves and feel more connected to others so um, we can thrive. Uh, this curriculum is trauma-informed. That's something we hear a lot about these days. Um, and, you know, learning the best information about how trauma impacts uh, the body and the brain and health across the life cycle and understanding that we can then respond to it in ways that um, are needed, depending on the age or um, situation of the person affected. Um, but we always want to add that we're resiliency focused because it turns out there's a lot of information about there out there about noticing just how resilient we really are. And uh, we'll talk about this in a bit, but we do tend to be a little focused on uh, what we call a negativity bias because we're hardwired above all else to survive. So we're, we're kind of trained to pay attention to threats more so than um, taking in the good or the things that actually um, help us uh, feel better and more uh, with our thinking brains online so we can make good decisions and deal with things and be more connected to the others. To others. So um, resiliency focus is where we try to land with this material. I know you've also had some education on adverse childhood experiences or the ACEs study. And that can be really um, hard to hear that so many folks, uh, it's much more the rule than the exception are affected by really hard things that happen between uh, zero and age 18. Um, but these tools give us something to do about adverse childhood experiences, which is very hopeful and encouraging. Uh, tonight, we'll learn a little bit about how our body and brain respond to stress and trauma. And uh, Victor will pick up the part in just a few moments about how we can claim this ability to have the owner's manual to our own nervous system and how using that information is so empowering. When we uh, met with Mason and Ann the first time, they talked about some of the very normal struggles that we're all having with kind of getting sometimes honestly sick of being around the same people all the time <laughs> and how that can create some rubs and disconnection and uh, make us all a little cantankerous once in a while, which makes us, some of us feel bad about ourselves when we're, when we're not so easy to be around or 
you know, just what do we do when we're in such close proximity to so few people? So we'll be talking about how do we increase and restore connection and compassion for the whole picture and ourselves and others. So our, our ultimate goal here is that uh, even in the midst of the hard thing, we can stay well and find the, the, the pieces that help us get through it. So uh, we wanted to start with just a little um, demonstration here of how this works. We like to get to the particularities, but before we do, we try to kind of show a, an example of what it looks like when it's kind of all put together. And I wanted to do that with one of you, Mason or Anne, to get you to talk to me just a little bit about something that's, uh, that's tough for you during this uh, season of the pandemic. If you'd be willing to be a little bit vulnerable with that, I don't want you to share the hardest thing about it, but just something that's challenging you, that's affecting you right now and give me a chance to connect with you and just talk with you about it a little bit before we then back up to talk about what was, what was happening on the inside in a little more scientific detail. Does one of you have something that you'd be willing to share that's uh, a bit difficult sure. for you right now? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I let me ask you what's what is going on that's what's going on that's challenging you right now. Um, just the the isolation from comrades. Um, I have been um, and my the congregation knows this about me, and you may not, but I do a lot around addiction um, because I lost my son. So a lot of my work and my forward movement has been uh, around policy at the county and working with those organizations. And, you know, so it's, it's been very rewarding because they've actually done some things. Um, and, and I have felt really good that I've had a, a small role in getting that stuff done, but now I can't see these people. <clears throat> I can't meet with them. I can't, you know, it's, it's not tactile. And so it's so much harder to convey or to get with folks just because um, I will tell you, sometimes I reach out and I'm not hearing back so much. And it's not because they don't want to talk to me, it, but everybody's just so covered with COVID. You know, I, I've made a joke in the church, you know, instead of TMI, it's TMC, too much COVID. And yeah. so I think people, everything's Zoom, everything's virtual, and they're just worn out. So I get that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't get my interactions anymore outside of my little house. Right. Um, so that's kind of been my, my challenge. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the, that description of uh, what's difficult, what would you say is the thing that's the hardest about this whole lack of connection, not getting your tactile, being everybody's covered with COVID? What's, what's the piece that's the, the, the worst? I'm, I'm just sitting, you know, I'm, I'm sort of spinning. Yeah. And um, I like to see forward movement. And it's much easier to connect with a, with a elected official if you've got them in front of you. And you can have that conversation and kind of get the body language. Mm -hmm. um, I'm much more effective that way than I am on this screen, honestly. So yeah, um, it's frustrating to feel like I'm not getting anywhere. Right. So let me make sure I heard that right. Uh, the hardest thing about it is that you're... Um, at first, it's. I think you said you're just sitting, but then you said you're spinning. Yeah. And you can't, uh, you can't um, connect and get that feedback that you're listening to. So uh, it just, it just feels like you're not able to make the kind of forward progress that you're used to making. Correct, and that's and part of it's the grieving process. So it feels like I'm sort of not not regressing, but the forward movement helps with the grief process. And I have to imagine that's possibly true for other people who've had losses during this past year. Yeah. How do you deal with loss if you can't have that connection? Right. So connecting with others and feeling like you're making a contribution really yeah. helps you deal with your grief. So that kind of comes back up for you when you can't make that the same kind of connections and forward movement. Well, so I want to say to you, Anne, that really, really makes sense to me that you feel and think those things and are experiencing exactly what you're experiencing. That, that really makes sense to me. And um, as you're telling me about it, I'm wondering, uh, is there anywhere in, you know, in your body that it shows up that you're feeling this lack of forward movement or any tightness anywhere or any 
temperatures or any anything you notice that goes ten with pounds of weight. <laughs> it feels heavy. Is that yeah, literally ten pounds of weight? <laughs> oh, you mean uh, that we've all gained a little little bit of weight these days? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of yeah. That's my biggest tell. Right. Just as you're aware of that, that we all are getting the quarantine five, 10, 15 or whatever. Yeah. Well, so I'd like to ask you what, what, um, you know, when you're aware of this and struggling with feeling like you're kind of stuck and can't support yourself uh, emotionally, like we do when we grieve, we, if we can get something done, it helps. Like you said, um, what, what helps you when you're feeling like, kind of like you can't get a handle and get some traction right now? What's something that is helping you get through it? Um, history, reading, you know, that's, it's, and, and especially with everything else going on in the country right now, looking back and reading about Truman or mm -hmm. some other leadership uh, has been helpful, you know, in history. Yeah. So as you think about him, what do you notice now as you're aware that he's kind of in the picture as well? Well, for me, it's more the distraction, you know, so if you're reading, it's really hard to think about anything else other than what's on the printed page. So as much as his story is compelling, it's more the act of the uh, reading. Okay. Um, All right. So changing the subject and correct. moving to another topic. Is that settling to you when you do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So uh, we might say that this uh, creating a distraction for yourself around a historical figure is, is a way that you, um, kind of highlight in the, in the midst of the hard thing, you, you raise up that little helper there that gets you through it. Um, and we'll talk about that more as we go through this curriculum, why that is helpful to you. So uh, we talk about this uh, thing called our resilient zone and it looks like a flag of some country, but what we're actually talking about here is, and what it feels like on the inside our physical experience of feeling connected and settled somewhat uh, when we're kind of in a good place, you know, and we call it our zone or our, our balance zone when we feel pretty good. So you can see there um, in this graphic that uh, the wave in the middle, and as we go through life and each, each day even, um, there are things that happen, uh, you know, that are a little challenging, like maybe when we're going to the grocery store, uh, there's a person uh, behind us in line who kind of gets too close to us and uh, maybe they don't have their mask over their nose as well as their mouth, you know, and so we're going to get a little charged up about that and we have to kind of settle ourselves. And if we're in a pretty good place, we can do that. Uh, it's not ideal, but if we're feeling like our cup is kind of full, we can kind of settle back down and make our way through the checkout line. And then other things might happen during the day, like maybe um, Ann can't get that person on the phone and, you know, it's a little stressful because something, you know, you really care about, you want to communicate during this time of distance. And maybe it takes a few times and you finally get them on the phone and you get settled again, you know, or maybe, um, maybe Mason is, uh, around uh, the folks that he lives with uh, and it's getting to him after a while during COVID. And so you can just kind of feel that little amped up thing going on in your body, but maybe you can go outside and go for a walk and kind of settle yourself again. And when we're in a good place and we're feeling not overwhelmed or uh, like there's too much stress or big energy, we can kind of just go with the flow. Uh, but sometimes harder things happen, uh, you know, bigger deal struggles. Uh, maybe somebody almost runs into us when we're driving to the grocery store, or uh, maybe we just are kind of fed up with uh, being in close proximity to someone else. And we really get kind of bumped out of this zone and we can get really amped up and reactive and hyper and kind of um, anxious and it sticks with us for a while. Maybe we don't sleep well that night or in the opposite direction, uh, our system, our nervous system can kind of get shut down where we feel like just quitting or not getting out of bed that day, or just kind of going off by ourselves and not talking about it. 
disconnected or kind of sad, maybe even foggy. We don't, we, we can't find our words. You know, we're just kind of frustrated and sick of the situation. We might even feel physical pain and uh, like withdrawing for a, a while. Um, so we just want to say that what we're aiming for here is to teach some tools and to show some grace for ourselves. Cause this is not like a pathological situation here. This is what happens to everybody. You know, we're, we all get these jolts or harder things than, than, uh, than the little things that can bump us out of our, our zone. And we need some tools to help us get back in. And we want to just cut ourselves some slack because this COVID thing, it's definitely a jolt and it doesn't just come once, but it's like this little niggle that comes every day, all during the day. And it's always there right now. And that's, that's just real. And that's hard. So now I want to um, turn over to Victor, who's going to talk about what this material has to say about um, our balance and resilient zone and why this is so exciting. So one of the things that we consider with this model is that we want to treat our nervous system as um, something that we take care of. And in order to take care of it, we have a, a owner's manual, if you will, of understanding our body safety and threat detector. We can let me see, let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And we are thinking of our brain, how our brains develop which is biologically from the bottom up. And in this way, we think about McLean's model of the triune brain, where we have the survival brain at the bottom developing first, and then we have the emotional brain in the middle and the thinking brain. And this is for the purpose of understanding how we connect with ourselves and connect with each other. So within that survival brain, that's where we have our autonomic body functions or automatic. This is where we're learning where our body's managing our heart rate, breathing. You know, fortunately, we don't have to think about taking a breath. If we did, we'd be afraid to fall asleep, of course. Our bodies take care of that for itself. Also, our digestive, fun digestive functions and so forth. In the emotional part of the brain, that is where we have our attachments to other people how we feel, do we love them, do we dislike them? That's where our emotions are. And that's also where we have responses that are based on memories. Now, the thinking part of the brain, this is where we are able to process options. Is option A, B, or C better for us? This is also where we have our language, our ability to uh, understand what other people are saying to us, as well as our ability to form communication well with others. Uh, within that uh, emotional brain, the, in the middle there, is a small region called the amygdala. And the amygdala is... Uh, a part of the brain that works like a smoke detector. It's always searching and evaluating for safety as well as for threat. So when something happens and it startles us, it sends a signal out throughout the rest of the body that there's an alert, maybe there's a survival risk, or it may be interpreting it that way. So the amygdala is really important and it's always working testing things out for safety and for threat. Now, one of the really important concepts that helps us to think about how we are responding to a situation is the hand-brain model uh, developed by Dan Siegel. So I'm going to explain Dan Siegel's hand-brain model, and I'm going to use my hand in this case. So what I'm gonna do is tuck my thumb in, and you guys can join me with this. Tuck my thumb in, roll my fingers over the top like that. And I'm gonna hold my hand up to my head to represent my brain, okay? So I'm gonna take my brain back out, open it up. And my wrist is representing my brain stem, going up into the survival part of my brain. This is where we have a fight or flight. You've heard those terms before. 
but also freeze, submit, and collapse. And that is where the brain is working on automatic to keep us alive. This middle part is the emotional brain. And this is where I have the way that I feel about things, happy, sad, mad, glad, adoration, whatever. But that's in the emotional part of the brain, as well as memories. My thumb is representing my amygdala. And the amygdala is that smoke detector that's always checking out the environment for safety and threat. My fingers up here representing my thinking brain. And this is where I have my ability to make choices and to evaluate things. So uh, this is also where I have my expressive language, my ability to form words that mean what I'm thinking, as well as my receptive language. Am I able to interpret correctly what you're saying to me? When it's all together, my thinking brain connects and integrates the rest of my brain is able to receive information and process it and problem solve. Most importantly, this is where it's able to problem solve. But if something happens that sets my amygdala off, sounds the alarm, then the thinking brain flies off, it's basically disconnected. The survival brain is now in charge and this is where, unfortunately, I may say things I don't really mean or I'm embarrassed about later. If it's a spider, this takes over and I'm about two blocks away before I know what has happened. But that's the survival brain trying to keep me alive. And yes, I do have a thing about spiders. Okay, but what I want to do is I want to be online. This is where I can problem solve. I don't want to be offline because I can't do much problem solving there. Wonderfully, we can help each other. So someone else, let's say like Beth, if she approaches me and she's online, then maybe she can help me to get back online, now can problem solve. And this is called co-regulation, where two brains that are on, well, two brains are able to help each other, okay? But this is a big part of us being connected as human beings and how we need each other so much to get healthy and to stay healthy. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic is kind of another word for automatic. And in this illustration, we're considering the autonomic nervous system, which is designed to keep us alive. But as Beth was talking before, it has a charge up function and a slow down function. So in this case, we're considering there's a gas pedal function for the autonomic nervous system that puts more energy into our system during times of stress or danger, kind of gets us out of the way, run down the street, but that's also our fight or flight response as well. The other part of the autonomic nervous system is a brake pedal function. So it allows us to slow down so that our bodies can rest, so that they can recuperate, so that we can relax with other people. Um, it also can immobilize the body during times of a life threat. So we might think of what happens with an opossum when there's a threat, a danger, its nervous system, not its thinking brain, but its nervous system takes over and it collapses because its nervous system has developed to understand that its best way or best chance of being safe is to look like something that's already dead and therefore not edible for a lot of predators. But that's not a, a cognitive position for the possum, but rather that's an autonomic nervous system response for it. We do the same thing. Uh, we can have that deer in the headlights type of reaction where we freeze, or we may uh, decide to give in to a tough situation, or we may just literally pass out faint. But that's our nervous system taking care of us, trying to keep us alive during a time of stress or life threat. 
The resiliency tools in the Reconnect for Resilience program actually give us a means to turn off that overwhelming uh, dysregulating stress response and turn on our relaxation response so that we can, can connect and so that we can heal. So here's a breakdown of the human nervous system. Uh, on one side, we have the sympathetic branch of our nervous system, and we can see how in a time of great uh, danger or peril in order to energize the body and get more energy into the larger limbs, we're going to have an increase in the heart rate, the um, lungs take in more air, um, we also have a release of the stress hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol. But notice that we also have a slowing down of the digestive system because it's not needed. That's, that's energy, that, that's a, those are functions that don't require energy at that time because they're not geared towards fight or flight. Uh, after the danger is over, our body will activate the parasympathetic side of the nervous system where the systems start to come back online, the airways relax, the breathing slows down, the digestive system comes back online and so forth. Of course, in the time of really deep stress or if the body interprets that the proper thing to do is to shut down, the parasympathetic turns off everything and the person may literally um, may literally pass out. So, but that's how our bodies take care of us. And it's so important to keep in mind that these are not things that a person is thinking about doing, but rather these are means that our bodies use to take care of us because it's trying to stay alive. And that's a wonderful thing in itself. Yeah, um, Victor, if you don't mind me just adding that uh, one way of looking at this uh, using some of the images we've already had is that the one on the right here, the sympathetic, that's the gas pedal. And the parasympathetic is the brake pedal. And we need to have just like that wave on the resilient zone, an interplay of both, you know, because otherwise, if you think about the wear and tear on any of these systems of our body, when the gas pedal stays on all the time, or the brake pedal stays on a lot of the time. Um, that's why understanding how this works and using these tools is so helpful because we really can learn to talk to this uh, system of our body in such a way that um, we can turn off these responses that are so wonderful when we need them, but not so great if they stay stuck on all the time. Mm -hmm. So we will um, be teaching a few of these tools uh, not all of them, but just to give you a little uh, idea in case one day you want to have a parish retreat and do both of the, the, the whole two days, hint, hint, <laughs> um, the, you would learn all of these tools. But for the purposes of these two sessions, we're going to just teach you um, a handful of them and try to relate them to, um, you know, this thing that we're dealing with during the pandemic. Sensen is the tool that is found in the middle of our sort of pinwheel of all the tools. And the reason for that um, is because the language of this survival part of our brain is not words or even emotions, but it has to do with physical sensations that go with feeling safe or not safe. So, Anne, when I was talking to you about, um, uh, I was asking you some really odd questions uh, about when you're aware of feeling uh, disconnected or like um, you can't get that forward motion going and that's frustrating because it helps you, um, you know, kind of deal with uh, some grief and things and, and you can't have that connection right now. I would ask you about your physical feelings about that. And you said something about it feels heavy and there might be some other sensations or physical feelings that go with that. And the reason I ask you that is um, as we move through teaching some of these, we'll learn that um, the way to signal safety to this survival part of our brain is by noticing the physical feelings that go with feeling calmer or safer or connected to another person. Because we can't, you know, when, when we're uh, 
you know, when our buttons are punched and we're out of our zone and we, and our lid is flipped, we don't have access to our big grown up words and thinking our ways out of the situation or even feeling our ways out of it. We have to deal with um, the real basic survival part of ourselves. So we're going to try some tools that help us find physical feelings that feel grounded and connected and just safe or settled. And the reason for that is that each of these parts of the brain that Victor talked about, they each speak a different language. The survival brain speaks language of physical feelings. We have emotional language here and we have higher critical language skills and math problems up here. So to, to get our brains back online, we have to go from the bottom up where it started feeling unsafe to us and out of our zone. So um, I hope folks will remember this um, coming into next week. We'll probably review it that when we feel um, more connected and safer and like we're in that place of balance and can go with the flow, we'll notice physical feelings in our muscles, in our breathing, in our heart rate. We can begin to tune into these. Sometimes there'll be a temperature that feels more pleasant and we might even notice, a, you know, a settling pressure or um, maybe even a little bit of tingling in our fingers or in a way that's pleasant. So we'll begin to talk about these. And when Victor does a little demonstration with me at the close of our session tonight, I'm going to make sure to talk this language of sensation to give you an idea of, of what we're trying to communicate here. All right, Victor, you want to talk about this new take on uh, that there's more than just fight, flight, or freeze? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, let me see. There we go. Um, so as we look at this pyramid here of our automatic survival responses, if you notice at the top, you have the light green square with the two kids and it says connect. That goes along with that um, uh, resilient zone that Beth was explaining to us earlier because our first natural response in the face of a threat is to connect. We are communal creatures. We need each other for survival. And that is so important for our, our ability to survive in the world. Uh, the next level, assuming that connect is not available, then the nervous system goes into fight or flight, looking to fight back or to run away from whatever the threat is. And you can see that that area corresponds with the amped up area of the resilient zone uh, because that's where we have more energy in our system and there's a, a need to get away from whatever the threat is. Below that in the dark green uh, area is the freeze, submit, and collapse. And that goes along with the shutdown area of that, of that diagram where a person may freeze, stop in their tracks, submit, give in, or collapse, lose all energy. And it's so important to keep in mind that these are autonomic or automatic nervous system responses. They're not necessarily within our control. Now we can create a broader resilient zone with the practice of the tools that we're talking about and that we'll be learning. But as far as the brain body connection, these are automatic survival responses. You want to talk about these as what they look like with adults? Um, and if we have time. Certainly, certainly. And I, and I would also welcome any questions from Mason and Ann as far as examples of what this looks like for adults. Uh, well, of course, we have our connect with the couple just smiling and looking into each other's faces, which is so important to what we refer to as the heart face, uh, heart face connection in that zone. 
Um, fighting does not necessarily look like a fist fight, but it could be some other ways that it would present itself. So Mason and Ann, we'd love to have you jump in. What are you thinking about a way that adults express fight energy? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, lots of different ways these days. And unfortunately, I think one of the things the Internet has done and, and social media and, uh, and email has allowed us to express our anger, quite frankly, in a lot of ways we, with a lot more vitriol and, uh, than we would ever have done uh, in a, in a, in a face-to-face with folks. Um, although, you know, arguing face-to-face uh, quite frankly, is a lot. I, I've finally decided it's a, it's a lot more constructive than trying to argue with somebody via email or over the internet, or uh, where you're not having to look somebody in the eye and, and hear their voice and hear, you hear theirs, and you're m- more likely to express a, a lot of anger that you you wouldn't face to face. For that example, that that is so important. Yeah, we lose a lot of information in the uh, in our electronic communication, but it does seem that people are so much more willing to express the negative and even hurtful side of themselves, sometimes electronically. Um, what about flight? What comes to your mind in the case of um, flight as a response? What might that look like? Well, you know, uh, I guess simply withdrawal, uh, you know, and I think uh, that's that's what a lot of folks do. They just uh, they decide uh, since as adults, we, we don't uh, typically physically flee. We mentally flee. And mm. uh, withdrawal is certainly one of the ways that happens with a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we hear so much of people, you know, not answering or returning phone calls to find something else to do. The energy goes in a different direction or just pushing people away. So there are different expressions of this among us as adults, but they, they do absolutely exist. And of course, below that for adults and Beth, by all means, please jump in here uh, with freeze. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, when you um, show an example of this connect tool in just a moment, um, as we wrap up our first night of this um, teaching, um, I'm going to talk about that, actually, because I've been finding myself really stuck. And I could relate to, you know, what Ann was saying about how um, not only do we feel stuck that we can't uh, sometimes make some of the progress and forward motion that we want to make right now. But um, when I feel overwhelmed and uh, just kind of sick of this pandemic thing, after a while, I just shut down and feel like I'll just kind of fog out. And um, it's like I lose track of time, things like that. Um, So I'm hoping that in a moment when you kind of talk to me about this, I can get a little help from you about that, Victor. I will do my best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have submit, um, and and I have found myself uh, doing that. I, I think I tend to be a little bit. Uh, what's that word? Um, it's I don't know if I want to say obstinate. Um, contrary, con- contrary. I don't know. I find myself giving in a little bit more now. Maybe a lot more. I said, "What's? Well, it's not like me to do that." But yeah. But we have, but over time, our systems become overwhelmed and we may find ourselves doing things differently than what we were doing before and wondering why. So this whole situation of COVID and stress and everything else that's going on, it does take a toll on our nervous systems. But I love this pyramid because it gives us the way to kind of find ourselves and consider where we are. And I know it really does help me to make the effort to connect, to get back in contact with my people, 
Of course, Beth being one of them with Reconnect for Resilience, and we can jibber jabber and connect for a little while, and it always makes me feel a lot more um, together than what I, I may have been feeling before. So these are really important, and I, I love the fact that the most healthy thing for us is to connect, and that's where our healing is also often um, accessible. And then, of course, we have this collapse, again, just kind of hiding out, Netflix all day, uh, can't get off the couch, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. One of our tools of resilience is the Connect tool. And in the Connect tool, we're creating a sense of safety uh, without judgment with another person. It requires, uh, one of the components of it is a mirroring component. And in the mirror component, we listen without responding, really without thinking of what we're gonna say next, but we are really focusing on being with the other person and listening to what the other person is saying. With this tool, we're also matching their expression as appropriate. Uh, allowing ourselves to feel what they're feeling and for that to show on our faces. And we're also utilizing their words. We're not trying to come up with fancy expressions or anything, just giving them back their exact words because that's what they've said. It requires a lot less energy for, uh, from us. We can really focus on being there with them during this time. Another part of it is to empathize. And in utilizing empathy, we're not focusing on agreeing with them. That's not required. But what we are doing is connecting through our words with a really simple but meaningful statement such as, that makes sense to me or you make sense to me, or that makes sense to me because. Again, this is not about evaluating what they have said, and it can be so much more meaningful than to say, I understand. Consider, I've not walked in your shoes, I don't have your experiences. So it might ring a little bit odd if I were to say, I understand, and that's practically impossible. But if I were to say to you, you make sense to me, that makes sense to me. That could ring a lot more true because I'm accepting you where you are. And that's a major part of this connect tool in creating safety and non-judgment. Yeah. And I remember when I was um, talking to Anne a little earlier, I really was very serious when I say to you that what you were describing this experience, it really does make sense to me that you would feel just the way that you feel and be thinking the thoughts that you're thinking and struggling with um, that disconnection and lack of feeling like you can move forward. Um, some of us, uh, have had to fight in our families of origin to feel like there's space for us or that we get, you know, the right to feel how we feel. Um, maybe we were criticized for not feeling appropriately or whatever. So this can often settle the nervous system just to have somebody bless you with uh, sincere words that it makes sense to me that a human, you know, right alongside me, that you feel what you feel and yet your experience is what it is. And I felt that. <laughs> Yeah, and and to begin to notice what the what happens in your body when you have somebody say that to you, um, so your nervous system settles. Yeah, that's right, Anne. Thank you for letting me know that. So, Victor, you want to try this on me? I could use a little connect. All right, let's try it. And and we want to commend this to the folks that uh, are watching this to try this between now and the next time that we gather. Okay, so Beth, uh, just to think of something that you feel a little bit of stress about, and I'm going to listen. All right, so um, I am, as you know, getting ready to um, finally take some time off, and I haven't taken any time off 
during this whole COVID thing, really, um, maybe a little bit, but I haven't seen my family for over a year. And um, we're trying to set up the conditions that would make that a, a safe thing to do. I mean, really careful conditions, including people having had their COVID shots and uh, all of that. Um, but uh, just trying to um, close up shop and get out of town is really challenging. And I feel like um, I've been feeling a little crunchy today uh, because people keep texting me and asking me, did you remember this? Are you going to do that? Are you gone yet? What's going on? And, uh, you know, all I can say is um, getting ready to leave is, is, is pretty stressful. And I'm feeling that uh, right, right now in my body between my shoulder blades and uh, uh, in my jaw, even as I'm telling you about that, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the pressure of uh, getting ready to be gone. Mm. And I didn't tell you in one sentence, did I? That's really good. All right. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm hearing is that you are trying to get things wrapped up so you can get out of town. And you're getting a lot of calls from people about things that, did you do this? Did you do that? Mm -hmm. And then you use, use that word, you're feeling kind of crunchy. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really neat word. But it's a lot of pressure as far as getting things wrapped up so that you can go and really take some time for yourself and for your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the different demands are pulling you. Uh, am I hearing you okay? You are, Victor. And even as you're just saying that the same words I used, and I feel like you listen to me, I'm doing that yawn thing, which you always say is a good thing, which means that my that means that your brake pedal's going on. Mm. It's not that I'm sleepy. It means that I'm feeling safe. And uh, we'll, we may talk more about that next week. But yes, you got that exactly right. Okay. All right. Well, with all those things that are going on, it makes sense that you feel this way, that you feel the pressure and, and just kind of pulled back and forth. Mm. So it makes sense that you feel the way you do, Beth. Okay. I can tell you that if I pay attention to my physical experience now, as you say that to me, I just took a really big, deep breath. Mm. And I didn't plan it. It just kind of happened. And I'm uh, feeling a little like I want to yawn again, which is a relaxation response. And I also feel a little, um, a little wet in my eyes, just a little bit. And uh, my face feels soft, like kind of relaxed like that. So, so uh, you have sent a message to me that I am, uh, that I'm safe right now. So really appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you for trusting me with that. Absolutely. Thank you so much to Beth and Victor and Anne and Mason. Great program and a lot of great information and lots to think about tonight. Let's bow together in prayer. Oh God, as you see us on our way, we thank you and praise you for constantly equipping us to be better informed, more knowledgeable, and with our hearts ever more open to our neighbors and our world and the needs that are there and the ways that we together and as individuals standing before you may carry your love and grace and care into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you on February 10th.
Thank you.